Please take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 10, if you would, please. Luke chapter 10. I want you to know that um, anytime somebody clears their throat or coughs, you think of coronavirus, I know. I want you to know that uh, I'm a little bit stuffy today, uh, not in attitude, but uh, in my head because of the dunk tank. That's my excuse, and I'm standing by it. And uh, uh, of course, we had uh, the Vacation Bible School this past week, and we had a great time. Uh, I think we had a total of uh, 307 children come. And so we praise the Lord for that. Amen. In this day and time. And I, I imagine we had more visitors uh, during this VBS than we've ever had. And uh, so we praise the Lord for uh, us being able to minister not only to our own children, but also to those in the community that had their children come. And uh, so, of course, uh, I don't know how many years I've been in the dunk tank, but uh, it's been a few, one or two. And for some reason, year after year, people get a little bit more concerned about me being in the dunk tank. Why? I have no earthly idea. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Uh, I'll just stop with that. <laughs> I feel like Humpty Dumpty sometimes, you know. But uh, at the same time, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing when the children get up there to uh, try to dunk you. Uh, and some of them, they get up there and their face are just stoic, you know. You think, okay, are they having a good time? And they, they dunk me and I go in and I hoop, holler and come back out and they're just still, <laughs> you know, no, just, okay. <laughs> and then you have others that throw a party. And uh, it's uh, really exciting, you know, to see them, uh, you know, sink the preacher. What really disappoints me at times, though, is when the adults seem to um, want to dunk the preacher and they have attitude when they do it. They put a little extra oomph on it. You know, I'm not going to name any names or anything, but at the same time, I wonder if they're not working frustrations out. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, you get to get to us about 52 weeks out of the year preaching at us, and now this is our chance to get you back, preacher. And so uh, they're going to take it all out in one or three, thro three throws, you know. So, uh, but we had a great time. And uh, we had nine professions of faith uh, to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so that makes it all worthwhile. And uh, so uh, you just, I mean, to have one soul get saved because of the efforts. And I want to just say thank you to all the uh, workers. I think we had over 130 workers. And people are saying, okay, 307 and 100, uh, that means we're over the limit. No, we, we're keeping the provincial guidelines according to day camp regulations. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We, we did. You know, they said that we, we had them segregated in different as parts of the auditorium and everything. And normally we have everyone fitting right here in these uh, two sections and we even had them this time up in the balcony and spread out on the wing sides and so on. And so uh, we made it work, amen? And so there's more than one way to pet a cat. <laughs> it's not exactly the way the saying goes, but mm, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But uh, we just had a great time. And I just want to say I appreciate all the prayers and flexibility of the church family during these months. And let's be praying as we do at our noontime prayer meeting and I know several of you have let me know that you're praying at home and sometimes you're taking some time from your lunch hour during work and you're praying for the restrictions to be lifted as well as that revival would happen. Because one thing we're noticing through this time of pandemic is that uh, spiritual weaknesses are being shown. We're finding out just, just exactly how strong our faith is as well as we're finding out some of our strengths. And so uh, that's a good thing. So that not the, to drive us away and not just to make us go into despair, but also to help us shore those areas up in our life that we need to and that we can be an encouragement to others. I want to uh, read as our text passage, Luke chapter 10. And these comments I just made have nothing to do with the message uh, this morning. But in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. The Bible here says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. 
But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. When you think of the various roles we fill in life, uh, probably one of the hardest aspects is the balance and the establishment of what I call priorities. If you were to go to many of the big bookstores or you would go online and go to certain sections, business section and so on, you'll see that there's a lot said about having proper priorities. Uh, you'll go to the home section and you'll see that there's a lot of talk about priorities. And so priorities seem to take front and center stage when we feel like our life is out of balance. Some in the business community will use what we call iCalendar, they'll use to-do lists, they'll use three by five cards, and other tools to help one stay on track with what they need to accomplish for the day. Uh, many people in the home, when they start thinking about uh, home and work and life balance, they will think about priorities and how things ought to be in place. And so they're looking to have, you know, a certain number of hours for this and a certain number of hours for that and so on. And people fool themselves, I think, to thinking that somehow the key is some scheduled balance. And yet life is not that way. In other words, while routine has its place, life doesn't always play by the rules we establish. And many times we beat ourselves over the head because somehow life doesn't really work out the way we envision. Somehow the schedule we have set up that will somehow give us some security in spirituality and in accomplishing things when it seems like the car breaks down or the baby keeps us up all night or maybe you're just getting ready for church and uh, Johnny goes out to play and gets all muddy and dirty and I mean, it just sort of throws everything out of balance for us. They constantly surprise us. In this account, I think we see some things that are really interesting for our, uh, really our instruction that would, I think would help us uh, I know that this is a common account that we have read. At the same time, I, I think that there's a couple of truths that sometimes we miss that I want to draw our attention to this morning. We have several people that are mentioned in this account. We have Martha to be sure, we have Mary, we have of course the house of Lazarus, but we have disciples in Jesus mentioned in this passage of scripture. And I want to first of all give us the setting so that we can understand what's going on in this particular uh, point in the gospel account. Jesus and his disciples, if you were to read before this time, they have been busy preaching, teaching, performing miracles. In fact, right on the heels of this particular, uh, this, this account we find the parable or the account given of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus is teaching. He's really involved in spreading the news because he said, I must be about my father's business. And so we find him going throughout the then known world telling people that, hey, I am the Messiah. You need to trust me. And so we see where they come to this house. They knew that they could go to this house located in the city of Bethany. And this is the city where, of course, uh, uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus lived. It was a place that Jesus loved to resort to, to go to, to find refreshment. And so they, you can imagine the pressure that was upon uh, Martha and Mary at this time. Uh, here we don't just have uh, Martha having one guest drop by or two or three guests drop by. Jesus and the disciples drop by. That's a house full of guests. I don't know if you're like this at your house, but you know when you have people coming by, you usually prepare for it. Uh, you're usually busy cleaning around the house, you're making sure you have refreshments in place and you make sure that you're ready. And you can imagine the frustration that must have happened in the life of Martha as she's busy trying to entertain these guests, make sure that they're refreshed, 
And here's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so it's interesting to me that we find Jesus, though, when he's looking for a place of refreshment, he knows exactly where to go. Now, I'm one, when I read these accounts, I don't want to just read it for its historical value. I don't want to just read it to say, okay, Jesus did this at this day and another time he did this and so on. I'm looking for practical truths that I can draw from that might help me in my Christian life and pass those on. And I'm seeing some things in this passage that really bless me and encourage me and help me. And I want to pass those on this morning. And one thing I see here in this account, just getting the setting for us, is Jesus and his disciples, they knew where to go to get rest and nourishment. And I had to ask myself the question, what kind of a place do I have for Jesus? What kind of a place do you have for Jesus? Now, of course, he's gone to a physical place, and I know we're talking about the spiritual aspect, but also there should be something said about our homes. Uh, If Jesus were to be alive and well and walking in the flesh today, he is alive and well, we know, But I'm talking about if he were in physical form today, walking, and he needed a place of refreshment, if he needed a place to come and get away from it all and rest and and feel comfortable and feel at home, could he find that kind of a place at your house? I mean, or would you have to take the TV and put it in the closet? Would you have to change the programming that you have on your devices? Uh, the place where you have your computer, would you go and quickly erase its history lest Jesus should come and find that you have a different kind of place than what he's looking for? A place where he's not quite as comfortable, where he can't relax, where he's always on edge. The music that comes through on your home entertainment center, is it the kind that Jesus is pleased with? Would he be pleased to listen to what you listen to? Or when he would come through the door, would all of a sudden you hightail it for the off switch? Or would you do something else to try to get his attention somewhere else? And when I see this, I see that Jesus, as he's busy about doing the work of the ministry, why he came to seek and to save that which was lost, he could go to a place, Martha's house, Mary's place, and find a place of nourishment and refreshment. Could he find that kind of a place should he come to your house? I also see this. Can you imagine the special relationship that Jesus had with these ladies as well as other portions of scripture show us that Lazarus lived in Bethany as well. In John chapter 11, verse five, it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That's an interesting passage of scripture to me because you know it's even said of that of John, the beloved who wrote in the gospel of John, in John chapter 13, verse 23, it says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. It says that again about John in chapter 19, verse 26, and chapter 20, verse 2, and chapter 21, verses 7, and verse 20. I mean, Jesus has expressed uh, to the writers here that they could pen under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God these words, and yet we come across John chapter 3, In verse 16, for God so loved the world, we know that he's no respecter of persons. And I say, you know, people are as close to Jesus as they want to be. And that's an outstanding statement to make. Because many times we say, you know what, I could be closer to God if I grew up in different circumstances. If I had a better mom and dad, if I, if I had a, a better job, if I didn't have such a tight schedule and so on, and if this person hadn't done this to me and, and I didn't have these things happen to me in my life, then I could be close to God, but it's this person's fault or that situation, circumstance that has brought me to this point where I'm just not as close to God as I should be. You are as close to God as you want to be. And we find that these people, they wanted to be close to Jesus. And Jesus not only saw that these people wanted to serve him physically, but he could sense the love that they had in in their heart towards him. And he reciprocated that love. Oh my, what a powerful truth for us. 
And so he is no respecter of persons as it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, in James chapter two, it brings out the same truth. And we are to draw close to him. In James chapter four, verse eight, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And that word draw means to be near or to be at hand. And one thing you find about John, I know we're not talking specifically about John, but we find that John was always with Jesus and he got always as close to Jesus as he possibly could be close to Jesus. If there was a crowd of people, John was right there. When it came time to eat, John was right there. And you know, I'm going to chase a little bit of a rabbit this morning. I probably will illustrate this in another message sometime, but uh, there have been those who tried to make some untoward or un ungodly kind of uh, inference about John uh, being on the, uh, uh, resting on the, the breast of Jesus and the bosom of Jesus as we just read that portion of scripture. And that's because we're thinking from our Western mindset. And we have to understand that many times when they in the Middle East would eat, the tables would just be about this tall and the food would be spread out and the guys would actually be laying on their sides, on usually on their left hand. And so they would be around the table that way. And so when it talks about John being close to Jesus, it means that as he would reach there and as they would talk and have conversation, he was right next to Jesus. There was nothing untoward, there was nothing unholy. And God help anybody who perpetrates that kind of a lie that somehow there was some homosexual activity uh, between the disciples. And yet you find that in prevalent in some of the liberal circles today. And don't do that to my Jesus. And so when you read the scriptures, it's important for us to get the context, the setting down so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And so I just thought I'd clear that up because some people try to muddy the waters. But let me just say once again, people are as close to God as they want to be. I also see here that Jesus felt, as I said earlier, comfortable at Martha's house. And let me just reiterate this fact. Does he feel comfortable at your house? I mean, we take him wherever we go, do we not? You say, you know, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, and you're not your own. You're bought with a price, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. We recognize that, so not only am I talking about your physical house, uh, Jesus being comfortable to go, but also your spiritual house, the way you conduct yourself, the way you think, the way you talk, the way you act. Is he comfortable in your house? This temple of his that he owns, that's his because it's bought with his precious blood. Is he comfortable being here in your house? Or do we grieve him? Do we, do we pain him? Do we offend him? Oh my, do we quench the working of the Holy Spirit of God in our life? So we get a little bit of the setting here where here's Jesus and his disciples. Think about this. Here you have 13 men invading this house. And so there's the setting. They're in Bethany. They've been working hard. They're coming for a time of refreshment. Now let's look at the situation. As they have this house full of guests, these are not ordinary guests. Jesus and the disciples are there, and I'm sure the refreshments are in order. And when some read this account, they have the tendency to criticize Martha, and then they have the tendency to praise Mary. And on face value, I believe, though Mary has her priorities in place properly, Martha was doing a good work too. And so I think in the course of looking at Mary and Martha, I think we need to look at it from both perspectives. And I want to encourage us in this area of our priorities, our spiritual priorities today. I believe this is a powerful lesson on the priorities of life. I'm not talking about the particulars. I'm not talking about this is what you ought to be doing at eight o'clock in the morning. And this is what you ought to be doing at noon. And this is what you ought to be doing at six in the evening. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the overriding priorities that you can apply to every situation and every time of your life. I think it's good to both serve and to sit at the feet of Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, if you think about it, 
you'll spend more time serving in life than sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's not heresy. In other words, when you think of your devotional walk with God and being right with God, oh, how many of us wish that we could spend all day in prayer? How many of us wish that we could spend all day reading our Bibles? But you know, the fact of the matter is, we can't spend all day reading our Bibles. We can't spend all day in prayer. We can't have that concentrated time all day, 24 seven. There's a time to sit at the feet of Jesus. There's also a time to serve. And you and I are gonna spend more time really serving than we will sitting at the feet of Jesus. But you have to both sit at the feet of Jesus and serve. In other words, there's just a little bit of time that you sit at the table for breakfast, lunch, and supper, and maybe other times in between, there's just a little bit of time that you spend doing that to keep your physical nourishment up, and you, you will spend a whole lot of time doing other things called life. Uh, there'll be some times where, hey, you spend eight, 10, 12 hours a day working, and yet a little bit of time eating and having a leisure time of life. And that doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian because you have a devotional time and then you have a large amount of time spent in service for the Lord. In fact, you've got to sit at the feet of Jesus and then you have to serve. But at the same time, you have to sit at the feet of Jesus first and then make sure you're ready and being prepared to serve. We have some lessons that are being taught here and I want to just draw our attention to that uh, the, these two lessons, these primary two lessons uh, for us from this passage of scripture. And I believe that Jesus here is preparing these disciples. They're right in the middle of school. For three and a half years, these disciples are shadowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Other uh, followers of, of the Lord like Martha and Mary and Lazarus, we find that they are also being schooled, getting in preparation for the time that Jesus would ascend and no longer be uh, there physically, but yet they would still have to carry on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's teaching them some powerful truths, and that's why every time you see something on the physical realm happen in the Gospels, it's not there just to show us what he did physically for that day, for that time, there is a spiritual lesson and implication that he's trying to get across to us. And so having properly placed priorities, I believe, is essential in a life well-pleasing to God. And so let's look at a couple things. Number one, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I draw these applications from Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is a place, when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, this is a place where you can hear. And you know, when you're at his feet, there's no mistake as to what Jesus is saying. You know, sometimes as we maybe be in a large auditorium without having a sound system, if we talk quietly, it's hard to hear someone from a great distance away. Also, when people are sitting towards the back, you have to admit there, there are more distractions to distract you from what is being said by the speaker. I know there have been times when we've had other guest preachers come through here, and I sit over here sometimes with my wife, or I sit back there. If I sit here, I don't get distracted. If I sit there, I can see everything from this, this side of the auditorium, even in the balcony, as to what's taking place when I'm sitting right there. It's a lot easier, I find, for my eyes to catch that movement and to be drawn to that. And I have the potential of missing what the preacher is saying. And so I'm not here saying that you ought not be sitting in a certain part of the auditorium, but I'm just bringing out the fact that the closer you are, the less distractions that you have. And here you find, here's Jesus. He's only on this earth for a short period of time. And so we find Mary sitting at his feet saying, I want to get everything that I can get from the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, I think there's something about that that you and I need to pay attention to when we think about our daily walk with God. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, it talks about our time of prayer, that we ought to enter into our closet and that we ought to pray. Now, when you study the word closet in the scriptures, when you and I think of closet, what do we think of? 
We think of the place that we stuff everything when guests are coming over because we don't want anybody to see what's in our closet. And, uh, you know, just hopefully they don't open the door and everything comes crashing out of that closet. It's usually a place where we put, we may put our clothes, we may put uh, other things, storage uh, capacity. And to be sure, even in uh, Jesus' day, a closet meant that, but it, was, uh, it also had another meaning. And in the context of our passage of scripture, the closet actually deals with a private place. And we find here a powerful truth that you and I ought to have a private place. Now, I'm not trying to have you say, well, I've got to clean out my closet so I can sit in there. Uh, I'm not trying to say that you have to build an addition onto your house so that you can have, this is my place. But what I am saying is you ought to have a place. And that place is a private place where you can get with Jesus and you can sit at the feet of Jesus and not be interrupted. In other words, you can't do it while you're listening to something else. While other things are cluttering around you and clanking around you, you've got to be able to give yourself and to give full attention to what Jesus is saying and trying to teach you for that time. And I'm afraid in our busyness of society, what we're doing is we are, we're trying to have our devotions and do uh, multitasking as well. In other words, we're on our way to work, we're having our devotions. Now, I'm all for listening to scripture and I do that, but that can't be the only time I'm listening to scripture. Uh, I can't be dry, I, I can drive and I can pray at the same time, especially now you don't feel too foolish and you don't look too foolish because of the Bluetooth capabilities of most vehicles these days that people aren't surprised when they see you all alone in your vehicle and talking, you know? They say, okay, he must be on the phone. Yeah, phone to glory, amen? But at the same time, you know, you, you need to have that time where you, you can just concentrate without other distractions on what Jesus is trying to say to you, amen? And so a place where you can hear. Do you have that kind of a place? And maybe you need to have a reestablishment of priorities today to where you say, you know what? I need to spend some quality time sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I'm gonna do that by having a private place. And it could be that if you're out on the road traveling, it could be that you have to go to the washroom and you have to say, hey, does any of you have roommates? You have to say, hey, look, you know, anyone need in here for a while? And you may need to find a place there where you can have that quiet place, that private place. You may have to close your Bible, put it underneath your arm, go out and sit in the car. You may need to go out into some other place and find a place where you can sit at the feet of Jesus and where he can uh, talk to you and instruct you in what he has for you in your need for that hour, for that day. A place where you can hear and you should have that private place. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, I always say this is a place where scripture is prominent, where it's prominent. In Psalm 119, verse 99, the scripture says this, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. You know, meditation talks about just to ruminate. It talks about to meditate. It talks about to think on intently. And you can't meditate when your mind is so filled with all the clutter. And this is one of the values of having an early morning time with God. When I talk about early morning, yes, we have folks that work uh, from 2 to 12 or whatever it is in the afternoon to uh, midnight and so on. You have shift work. So your morning may not be the morning of someone else. But what the, what, what the truth here is, is the first of the day, the, the time when you're just fresh, where you can give your attention to hearing from the Lord and thinking about the scripture. When you're sitting at the feet of Jesus it's not just a matter of taking the information in. It's a matter of saying, here's what Jesus has said to me in his word. I need to think about this. I need to meditate on this. What is he trying to tell me? What truths can I get out of this for me today to live, to be instructed and to be matured in my faith so that I can be an effective servant for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you'll sit at the feet of Jesus but you're gonna spend a whole lot of time out there in the highways and byways of life. 
Jesus did. We see him in several of his accounts. He gets up a great while before day and he prays. But at the same time, when the sun comes up, you find him from early in the morning to late at night, he's serving, he's healing, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's serving, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's healing all day long. And yet he does not neglect that time where he can be with his father and get the instruction and the nourishment that he needs. He says, I have meat that you know not of. And that's how he can keep going. And that's how you and I are going to keep going and keep on track. Oh my, it's a place where scripture is prominent when you sit at the feet of Jesus. And then I see this as a place of preaching and praying. And I say this, and of course it fits because the church is not man-made, it's God-made. And in Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 7 we find Isaiah under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Even before the founding of the church, he says, my house is to be a house of prayer. You also find that reiterated in Matthew chapter 21 in verse 13. It's a place of prayer, the church is. And so when we pray, we have an opportunity to set aside the distractions of life and give ourselves to communicating as a whole with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's also not only a place of preaching and praying, but also, as I've just mentioned, preaching. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, what we're doing right now is building our faith. We may not realize it, but that's exactly what's going on. In Romans chapter 10, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why this modern church movement today that emphasizes the praise and worship aspect and it's all the hype and music and it does a little for, for the preaching of the word of God is so hurtful to us spiritually. We need more preaching than we do singing. Oh my, the singing prepares our heart for the preaching. It puts us in the frame of mind. It's not to just work us up to some fevered pitch and then as we leave, we leave the same way that we came in. God help us. The church is a place for the preaching of the word of God. You find when you study the scriptures, when people got in the presence of Jesus, they didn't want to sing, they wanted to hear him preach, they wanted to hear him teach. What does God have? And I trust when you came to church this morning, you said, I wonder what God has for me through the preached word. Through the songs that are sung, yes, that's why I like the hymns. They're doctrinal, as Pastor Matt mentioned about that song that we sang. And it just builds one upon another. That was a powerful message in that song. Our Lord has defeated the devil, amen? amen. Praise the Lord. And so a church is a place for preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 21. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. The preacher's primary responsibility is to preach the word and to be instant in season and out of season to reprove and rebuke with all long suffering. Amen? And so we find the church is a place of preaching. We, I say this, when you are sitting at the feet of Jesus, you are not concerned about anything or anyone else but what he is saying. And that ought to be how you approach the services of Pemina Valley Baptist Church. Where you come and you say, look, I'm going to open my Bible and I'm going to see what God's word has to say. I'm going to make sure that my pastor is reading from the word of God. That he's not just giving his opinion on something. That he's got the right Bible and he's got the right message because my Bible and the message that I know is still the same. Amen. Amen. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. We need to sit at the feet of Jesus. Joseph Hall in 1868 wrote the, the, the words to uh, the song, Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. And he used verse 39 of our text as his text. Here's verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Here are the lyrics. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say. Happy place, so near, so precious. May it find me there each day. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, I would look upon the past, for his love has been so gracious, it has won my heart at last. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, where can mortal be more blessed 
There I lay my sins and sorrows, and when weary, find sweet rest. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, there I love to weep and pray, while I from his fullness gather grace and comfort every day. Bless me, O my Savior, bless me, as I sit low at thy feet. O look down and love upon me, let me see thy face so sweet. Give me, Lord, the mind of Jesus. Keep me holy as he is. May I prove I've been with Jesus, who is all my righteousness. So here we find Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, but also you find Martha serving. Now, after sitting at the feet of Jesus, I say, then there's the time of serving. One part is not better than the other, but both must be in their proper order. And we have the tendency as humans to just sort of invert those. We, we change those up. We have the tendency to put the flesh first and then the spiritual last. And Mary, she had her priority exactly right. Yes, it's great to sit at the feet of Jesus. It's also great to serve. And the lesson I find in this passage of scripture is Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, we all ought to be there. But there comes a point in time where we have to get up and we have to go to serve. And that's what we find here in this passage of scripture. And I see here about the proper order. Number one, I see this, the needs of others are great. Look at verse 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. Can you imagine, once again, You've got Mary, you've got Martha, you've got Jesus, you've got 12 disciples. They've all just come. They need some refreshment. They need to be served. He, she wants to be a good hostess. Wouldn't you want to be a good hostess if Jesus came to your house? It says, Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. You know, we already know from a study of the scriptures in the book of Matthew, it says, look on the fields for their white all ready to harvest. The need is great. The needs of others are so great. As Mary looked about and she says, I'm just stressed beyond measure because I've got so much to do and I, I'm trying to make everyone feel comfortable here and take care of their needs. And folks, if you and I aren't careful, We'll look at the needs of the world. We'll look at those around us and we'll see the burdens and the cares that they have. And we'll say, boy, I need to be busy doing this. And I need to be busy doing that. And that's all fine and good, but make sure you sit at the feet of Jesus first and then get up and serve and serve to your heart's content. But don't put one at the expense of the other. The needs of others are great. The burdens that they have are heavy. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Folks, life can be overwhelming at times, can it not? Have you ever come to that point where you just say, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And the only way you'll be able to take it is as you sit at the feet of Jesus. And once you get and draw on his nourishment and on that refreshment, then you can get up and serve him. And, and it's just like what he says, if you give somebody a cup of cold water in my name, you've done it unto me. But we find many times what's frustrating for us in our Christian life is we sometimes are so busy serving that we get cumbered about because we haven't spent enough time at the feet of Jesus. And so then we get frustrated and we get upset at people and we get irritated and we say, why isn't so-and-so doing this? And why am I not getting help here? And why is this person getting away with that? And so on and so forth. And it just gets to be such a burden to even try to live the Christian life. And we need to be like Mary. But then after you've spent some time at the feet of Jesus, you need to get up and you need to serve. But life can be overwhelming at times. Understand John chapter 16, verse 33. Here he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. That's trouble. 
That's trials. That's heartache. He says, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen? And that's the value of having your priority right, folks. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we're walking with God as just simply to avoid a guilt trap. We walk with God because we say, I've got to read my three chapters today so that I can keep up with everyone else who's trying to read through the Bible in a year. I've got to make sure that I'm in church every time my letter of the alphabet shows up because if not, people are going to think I'm a backslidden Christian there do well. And we have this idea that we're trying to placate and please everyone else when that's, you're missing the whole point. The whole point is to sit at the feet of Jesus so that you can hear him. And as you sit at his feet and you have that time with him, he will instruct you, he will guide you, he will strengthen you. And then you can get up and serve and you can have that joyful attitude as you go through life. Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house where there's joy, joy, joy. Is everything all right? In the Father's house? I'm not talking about your physical house. I'm talking about your body. Is everything all right? Have you been sitting at the feet of Jesus? Or have you been cumbered about much serving? Or have you even served at all? Folks, I know this. If you sit at the feet of Jesus, you won't stay there. You'll get up and you'll start serving somewhere along the line. You remember, we, it wasn't too long ago I preached a message about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John go up to the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, and they see Moses and Elijah. God comes down in a cloud and says, hey, this is my son, hear ye him. I mean, after they, they come to themselves, they see Jesus only, and Peter goes, let's build three tabernacles. Uh, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And we'll just camp out here, Lord. This is a great place for us to be. And boy, there'll be those times you'll get in your prayer closet, so to speak. And you'll have a great time with the Lord. And you say, boy, well, let's just stay here. But Jesus said, no, we've got to come down off this mountain. We've got a work to do. My friend, we've got a work to do. And we can talk about the great commission all we want to. But if we don't first sit at the feet of Jesus and hear him, and draw on his strength, and go on the strength and power of his might, we will fail miserably. And we'll miss the peace that passeth all understanding that will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My friend, when I look at this passage of scripture, I see properly placed priorities. I see Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. And then she's gonna get up and she's gonna serve. I see Martha doing a good work, but by the same token, she needed to put her priority right. She needed to sit at the feet of Jesus and then worry about the serving. She'd have been much more effective, amen? Let's all stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, please. There is such value sitting at the feet of Jesus. Just stop and think, when you take your Bible and you open it up, you're sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is his word. He gave you from Genesis to Revelation, he says, you know what? Everything you need, I've got for you right there. You wanna hear him? You need to listen to him. Stop looking at your time in the word of God as simply a duty. Start looking as God wants to fellowship with you. He wants to have that personal time with you. Just stop and think about that. When you open your Bible in your quiet place, your private place, as you're opening the scriptures, he is talking directly to you. He's not talking to a crowd. He's talking to you. That's pretty special. When the king of all the ages wants to fellowship with you. And he wants to do that every day. I think if we start looking at our time with God in that light, it will make our service so much easier, so much more pleasant. As the musicians play, is there a decision you need to make today?
Maybe you need to say, you know, I need to have a complete makeover about my walk with God. Maybe you need to get your priorities right. Maybe you've been busy serving, but you've not been sitting at the feet of Jesus. So I might be talking to some real dedicated church people here at Pima Valley Baptist Church. You may be doing a lot. People may know you do a lot or they may not realize all that you do. But by the same token, you're busy, busy, busy serving God in the church. But let me ask you, remember what Jesus said, Mary has chosen the good part. And so there's a time to serve, but there's also a time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Have you been sitting at the feet of Jesus?